In the swamps and plain and scrub of Arnhem Land, in the Northern Territory of Australia, live the Miwai people, a tribe of about 400 Australian Aborigines. These primitive people live in an area stretching from Arnhem Bay on the Arafura Sea in the north to Blue Mud Bay in the Gulf of Carpentaria in the south. The Miwai people are divided into clans, each of which lives in its own particular territory. They consist of the Balamumu clan, the Ratatingo, the Kumite and the Wangari clans. There are also other territories common to all four. These are used as meeting places of the clans. Here is a part of their land, lying along the seacoast. The dark patches are clumps of mangrove trees and the rivers swarm with alligators. These are the Wangaris, a nomadic food gathering people always on the move. Even today they still follow their old ways of life, taking about with them their few weapons, tools and dilly bags which are their only worldly possessions. Today, in the 20th century, they are people who are still living in the ways of the Stone Age. The aprons these people wear, known as diddy-diddies, at night they settle down to camp wherever their wanderings have brought them. They may stay here for a few days laughing and gossiping, hunting and food gathering until the area is exhausted, and then will move on. Their word for camp is ninna, and means sit down. They camp down in family groups. Wives and daughters clear the ground of stones, twigs and prickly grass seeds. The men make fire by the primitive method of friction. Bajarbuma is twirling a stick in a hole in another piece of wood in which he has placed some charcoal. When the charcoal is red hot, he shakes it into dry bark that has been finely shredded. He blows on the charcoal embers until they catch the bark. The earth is their bed and they sleep in the open without covering in the long dry season. They make fires to keep them warm at night. In the season of monsoonal rains, however, they make themselves primitive shelters called bunbus, a very simple structure to shelter themselves from the heavy rain. The main support of the bunbu is a ring of bark cut from the gum tree. The men are using stone-headed axes. The bark is bent over and the ends are dug into the ground. If it stops raining and the sun comes out while they are making a bunbu, they will promptly stop work and only continue when it starts raining again. The structure is then covered with paper bark to stop the rain from coming through the cracks in the gum bark. When the man of the family has finished his part of the work, he crawls inside out of the rain and leaves his wife to finish off her part of the job.
At night, the natives light fires at both ends of their bumbus. The smoke blows straight through and keeps away the mosquitoes. Sometimes the smoke is so thick that they sleep with their noses to cracks in the bark to get air. These platforms on stilts are sleeping wrecks. The native name is Lundang. The natives light a fire beneath them and sleep in the smoke, which keeps away mosquitoes. After a meal, they go to their sleeping platforms. Others sleep close to their little fires. In humid weather, the smoke keeps away mosquitoes. In cold weather, they curl up right round their fire and light another at their backs to keep their kidneys warm. They sometimes roll onto the fire in their sleep, and many Aborigines have scars of fire burns on their back and abdomens. The old and the young dream of good hunting grounds. Early in the morning, in the Piccaninny dawn, as they say, the tribe awake and prepare to leave for the day's hunting and food gathering. Bajarabuma leaves camp with his spear and woomera and a word of advice to his elder wife. Presently, the women go out collecting grubs, roots and wild honey and small animals. The men fish with spears inside the reef. The men do the more active forms of food gathering, such as hunting and fishing, while the women and children search for such food as can be found lying about. On the beach, Namani, Mararawi and Widjiwidji have seen a turtle track and by this they know where she has laid her eggs. Turtle's eggs have soft, leathery shells and are very good to eat. The women dig up yam roots, the Aborigines potato. Others in the swamps are collecting lily roots. They are soft and pulpy and are a native delicacy. The quest for food may go on all day. At low tide, the women and children search inside the reef for shellfish and crabs. The Aborigines eat almost anything they can catch. Here, a family group are coming into camp with a 10-foot rock python. Fires are made and the python is heated to take out the stiffness so that it can be rolled up conveniently for cooking. The cooking is done by covering it with hot ashes from the fire.
Another group have brought in a goanna, a sort of lizard which tastes rather like lobster. This old woman is making dough from ground waraka nuts. The dough is then wrapped in paper bark and placed in hot ashes. It is baked into a sort of bread. Carving the joint is done in a primitive but effective way. Table manners may seem crude, but it is not very long ago that the people of Britain were eating with their hands. Shellfish are also popular. This is a large mud oyster that the woman is breaking open. Titbits for the children. The baby, Billy Billy, is making a hearty if messy meal off wild honey. This is found inside hollow dead trees and the children search for it by listening against the tree trunks for the buzzing of the bees. The local bee is small and stingless and is about the size of a housefly. The old men of the Miwai people hold council. The business of the tribe is directed by the old men, who are leaders and are treated with great respect. When they become too old to fend for themselves, they take young wives to look after them. A young child of the Wangari clan has died, and the old men are discussing plans for his funeral corroboree. An Aborigine's funeral takes place at two ceremonies, one at death and the second a good time later, when food gathering brings the clan that way again. The old men are also discussing the second ceremony of an adult who died some time ago. The burial ceremony takes place at no special time, but is used as an excuse for celebration. The men of the tribe make up their bodies with pipe clay for the death corroboree. The morning colour among the Aborigines is white. The scars on their chest are their initiation marks. They approach and leave the funeral ground, taking a zigzag course so that the spirit of the dead will not know which way to follow them and will not frighten the fish and animals when they go hunting.
The first ceremony is for every initiated member of the clan to placate the spirit of the dead so that the spirit shall do him no evil. Their gaiety is largely bravado in the face of the unknown. Some of the natives beat on sticks. The long droning pipe is the didgeridoo. Another chants. All the mourners are painted except the father. He wears no makeup since he has presumably treated the child with kindness and need have nothing to fear from its spirit. The body of the infant, wrapped in paper bark, is lifted onto the platform where it will be left to decompose. spirit pole is placed in the ground beside the platform. The bark around the top of the pole is symbolic of the spirit's hair. This spirit pole is to receive the bones of the adult. It is painted with the moran of the deceased. Each man of the tribe has a secret moran which is given him at initiation. It is a secret symbolic map so that when he dies, he may find his way to his dream time home, where he will dwell until he is reincarnated. The children of the tribe are watched for characteristics of the dead and are believed to be their reincarnations. This moran represents the sea, lily roots, taste together waters, meaning brackish water where the river meets the sea, a sandbank, seaweed, and a freshwater turtle. The initiated approach the sacred place a symbolic waterhole in which the dead man's bones are laid wrapped in paper bark. They dance round the bones and spear them to frighten away the spirit of the dead man. They wish him to leave his familiar haunts and return to his place in dream time. The leading dancer in the group is Leah Karin, the man who arranges the dances and songs of the tribe. As they have no written language, theirs is a memory culture. They remember as many as 2,000 song cycles, songs of their history and legendary.
The biting bag the native holds in his mouth has strong magic power. In it is often kept the dried blood of the deceased. The bones are smeared with red ochre and placed in the hollow spirit pole, which is afterwards stopped with bark and dried blood. The bones have now been rendered harmless. No spirits will come back to haunt the Wangari folk. The corroboree is over, and the clans are on the move again to There, the smoke wisps of their fires can be seen today. There, they will live and hunt and laugh as they have for centuries. These, the first Australians.